Hey Michael, the national animal of Russia is a bear. What sound does a bear make? That's right. Hey, nothing better to study on a late February day than the Russian Revolution of 1917. Because it was this time of year, 1917, when the Russians had a revolution. Michael, what does a bear say? That's right. Let's learn about the Russian Revolution. Yay! Hey there, Euro Bears. So we cannot underestimate the importance and the impact of the Russian Revolution. Arguably, it's just as important as the French Revolution that we spent far more time with earlier in first during first semester. But the Revo Russian Revolution, let's compare it first to the French Revolution. In both situations, there's pretty no what we would call middle class. There's a whole bunch of poor people and a handful of elite. And when you have this particular situation, the masses rise up against the elite. However, these masses were led by very well-educated, smart people who saw society as desperate for a change. So there is that particular commonality. Another commonality is they both ended up in dictatorships uh, with French uh, during the convention years. And then the Soviet Union, during the, by the time we get to the end of the 1920s, it's pr pretty clearly a dictatorship. But in both cases, the dictatorship said that they were working for the benefit of the people. There's going to be state-sanctioned terror uh, in the Russian Revolution, just like there was during the French Revolution. So the Russian, or during the French Revolution, they wheeled out the guillotines. After the Russian Revolution, there'll be a secret police force called the Cheka, which will interrogate and imprison and kill people. So they have that in common as well. But the Russian Revolution and the French Revolution can, are, are also different. Uh, Russia in the early 20th century was seen as lagging behind most of the other major European powers, both in terms of education, culture, industrial development, economically. Uh, the Russians were lagging behind the French, the Germans, uh, the British. Whereas in the 18th century, France was seen at the forefront of all of these things. So the French and the Russian Revolution are very different in that particular way. But the Russian Revolution is oh so very important. How is it important? Well, let's look at this. First of all, we have the first successful communist experiment in world history. There's that, and it inspires other socialist and communist revolts elsewhere in the world. You're going to have major revolutions in China and Cuba, for example, which will have a profound effect on, your, on, on world history. But there's also the response to this successful uh, communist state. There will be what we call red scares throughout the rest of the world, where there's going to be a fear that communism is in fact spreading. So, of course, in our country's history, we had two major red scares, one in the 1920s and then another one in the late 1940s, 1950s. But certainly after World War II, until the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, uh, the Soviets were sort of the boogeyman to the United States of America because we were the two emerging superpowers to come out of World War II. So that's very important. But then also think about this. Uh, the Russian Revolution, when it happened and, uh, and, and, and other countries were fearful of the spread of communism, this leads to the rise of fascism in Italy and Nazism in Germany. So the Russian Revolution indirectly sparks World War II as well. So that's not obviously the only reason why World War II happened, but uh, the Russian Revolution played a, played a big part in that. So it's a very big deal. It's an incredible story. I'm going to do my very best to summarize it meaningfully, but man, this is going to be a travesty of a recorded slideshow. I know it because there's going to be all these incredible details that I just simply can't get to. So hey, that's why you got a textbook. Or make, make sure you read your textbook as well as listening to me. All right. So before I actually get into the Russian Revolution, I want to take it all the way back to the 19th century. All right, remember that Russia, throughout most of Russian history, has been a land of serfs. What are serfs? Well, serfs are effectively peasants. They're not exactly slaves, but uh, it doesn't hurt to sort of thinking, think of them as enslaved people. But let's be technical about it. They are technically peasants. But throughout Russian history, they increasingly get more and more and more tied to the land. 
so that the landlords can effectively control them. Now, technically, serfs have rights. They're under the protection of the law, so they're not property, so they're not technically slaves, but certainly they suffered a whole bunch of abuse from the landlords. So Russia starts to lag behind the rest of Europe, especially when we get into the 19th century, because the peasants in Western Europe have increasingly been freed, and they're free to move around, uh, they're free to go and find, try to find jobs everywhere. Russia doesn't really industrialize because in order for industrialization to happen, you have to have an agricultural revolution, people have to leave the farms, they have to go to the cities, they have to get, in work, get new work in the factories, and then an industrial revolution can happen. Well, if you've got serfs that are tied to the land, you're never going to have an industrial revolution. So a big part of the entirety of Russian history is the fact that you've got serfdom and there's no land reform. It's sort of the old boyars are holding on to their old lands, and that sort of stagnates society. But then the Crimean War happens, the Russians lose. Alexander II uh, becomes czar during the Crimean War, during the end of the Crimean War. And after the Crimean War is all over, Alexander II says, all right, this is it. Uh, we lost this war because we didn't industrialize and Britain and France had. So we're going to industrialize now. So we're going to have to free the, free the serfs. So in 1861, after the Crimean War, Tsar Alexander II frees the serfs and gets the nickname Tsar Liberator because of this. However, one of the problems was uh, he did not provide a successful sort of economic structure for the serfs to go on and do other things. So just because you say, hey, you're free, um, doesn't really help the situation if there's really nothing else for those serfs to do. So we can compare this to uh, United States history. Uh, first of all, let it be known that the Russians freed their serfs uh, four years before the Americans freed their slaves. So hey, good on you, Russia. Uh, but also, just like in our own country's history where we had slavery and then slavery ended and it's like, all right, no more slavery in American history. Well, almost immediately after slavery ends, we have a sharecropping system that's put into place uh, during the Reconstruction era. We could pretty much look at that as a failure of Reconstruction. And so we just sort of have slavery 2.0 in the form of sharecropping. And then that lasts for another 100 years until the 1960s and the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So it's the same sort of thing that happens in Russia in the 1860s. Uh, the serfs are freed, but they don't really have a whole lot of opportunity to improve their lives. There was still, uh, things were still better uh, for the serfs. And I'm not an expert in this, so I can't really get into detail to, to, to the extent that things were better for the serfs, but they were better. Uh, you know, one of the things I actually can say about the, ser about the serfs, the freed serfs in the 1860s, is that they did form... Uh, uh, sort of village, local, peasant communities called mirs. Mirs is spelled M-I-R. And those mirs actually improved peasant life a little bit. But again, I'm no expert here, so I need to just shut up and get to the important stuff that we need to know. All right. So uh, one thing that Tsar Alexander II did do, which will have a pretty profound effect on Russian history at this, per and he does it at this particular point in time, is he establishes this. Now, I apologize, students, I do not speak Russian. I'm going to butcher this word. I always do, but let me do my best. Tsar Alexander II establishes the Zemstvo. <laughs> the Zemstvos were local councils all throughout Russia. So, he has freed the serfs. He is trying to modernize Russia, sort of like Peter the Great and Catherine the Great had once before tried to modernize Russia. And part of his modernization program was establishing these local councils that would be responsible for uh, local rules and taxation collection. So another way to think about this is a decentralization of uh, the, the Russian government. Now, what this does is it offers an opportunity for a wide variety of people throughout the huge Russian empire to become actively involved in politics. And there's the sense that, hey, we can have a say in our own local council and we can have a say in our own governance. So it can be seen as a step towards greater democratization. But of course, as we know, Tsar Liberator Alexander II here, because he did not engage in full land reform, there, was a, there were a wide variety of 
radical groups. Most importantly, the one that we need to know about is the people's will. And uh, this radical group, the people's will, successfully assassinated Tsar Alexander II. So when he dies and his son takes over, Tsar Alexander III, Tsar Alexander III becomes a staunch conservative. Alexander III's attitude was that it was because Alexander II engaged in some moderate liberal reforms that he got killed. It should instead be the goal of Russia not to be like the West, not to modernize, not to democratize, but rather to hold true to its old traditional Eastern Orthodox ways. So Tsar Alexander III is an excellent example of a conservative emperor in the late 19th century. However, his chief minister is this individual, Sergei Vita. Sergei Vita will serve under uh, Alexander III and Nicholas II in the early 20th century. And Sergei Vita who was a former railroad man, a little bit like Count Camillo de Cavour, who had, uh, who also, you know, made a bunch of money in, in, in railroads in the 19th century. Sergei Vita uh, becomes the prime minister of Russia under Alexander III. He's appointed by Alexander III, and Vita's argument is this: the only way the czars and the Russian Empire will survive is if they industrialize. They have to industrialize or the Russian Empire will fail. Now, this is antithetical to Alexander III's overall vision for Russia as being this very traditional conservative empire, but he places his faith in Vita. And Vita begins the process of seeking foreign financial investments into new Russian factories, the majority of which are going to be located in St. Petersburg. So that by the time we get to World War I, 1914, St. Petersburg will have approximately 100,000 100, men working in uh, manufacturing, working in the factories. All right, so that's the role that Sergei Vita plays in Russian history. Okay, let's go back to the royal family. The Romanovs. Okay, what do we need to know about the Romanovs? Well, we need to know that the Romanovs are completely detached from the rest of Russian society. They live this rather nice life, this rather posh life that's completely separated from the Russian people. This is always a terrible choice for a head of state to make, is to separate him or, or herself from their own people, so they have no real clue what the average, in this case, Russian is going through. They lived in an estate outside of St. Petersburg, and really the Romanovs, as well as the other uh, wealthier people of Russia in St. Petersburg, they, they, they lived a very modern life, and really the life that they were leading would be the same as any uh, duke or king or queen or whatever in Western Europe. They had, in the early 20th century, bicycles. They had roller skates. They had cars. They had these like new modern things in the early 20th century, and they lived this really modern life. Here is the royal family of Russia when we get to the early 20th century. Uh, in the center there, seated, you see Tsar Nicholas II. He is the last Czar of Russia. Standing above him, you see his wife. Her name is Alexandra. She is not Russian by birth. She's German. Continuing this tradition of, <laughs> of Romanovs marrying German wives. And then surrounding them are their four daughters. I will show you another picture of them on the next slide. And then there's their son, the young son, Alexei. Nicholas II, of course, wanted a son after having four girls because he wants a male to inherit the throne. And here are the Romanov girls, these beautiful princesses who were considered to be the most sought after princesses in Europe they might marry into, or they were probably destined to marry into other royal powerful families. But let's take a look at them. Here they are as rather young girls, I think early teens and younger in this particular photograph. Uh, from left to right, you have on your left, Olga. Uh, next to Olga, you have Tatiana. Next to Tatiana, you have Maria. And then there on the right, you have the youngest and probably the most famous, Anastasia. 
And Anastasia is uh, probably the most famous of them all, not because of anything that she did during her lifetime, but because of uh, some events that happened after her lifetime. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Here's another picture of the four girls and little uh, brother Alexei all together. And now might be an important time to talk about Alexei. Alexei, the young boy, was, uh, of course, the pride of his dad and mom because he's going to uh, inherit the throne later on. Or at least, of course, that's the plan. But sadly, Alexei has something called hemophilia. Uh, it is a disease which means that his blood does not properly coagulate. So, in other words, when he gets a cut, it's different from when you and I get a cut or a scratch, you know, where we bleed for a little while and then it scabs up. No problem. But if a blood doesn't scab up, then technically even a small scratch could force you to bleed to death. And so that was very scary for the royal family. Little Lexi was sick. He, of course, was had access to the best doctors in Europe, but none of them could really help Alexi, or at least nobody could cure him entirely. So this is going to become a very pressing issue for the royal family. We'll learn more about this later on. Okay, but we go to the early 20th century Russia and uh, back to the serfs who are now freed people and they are moving and migrating from uh, the countryside a little bit into the city and really the one city in particular and that is St. Petersburg. And so they start getting jobs in factories and when you have people working in the factories and the factory conditions are not great and the government doesn't seem to respond, you have the emergence of radical groups. And certainly there were quite a few radical groups in Russia, especially in the late 19th century. Alexander III made sure that all these groups went into the underground. There were pretty strict censorship and assembly laws under Alexander III, but they are still there. And now is when I get to introduce this particular individual. Vladimir Ulyanov, as he was called. Uh, that's his full name. That's his proper name. That's the name he was given. Vladimir Ulyanov was born to a middle-class family, a bourgeois family. He was very well-read. He was very well-educated. He was a smart guy. He spoke multiple languages. As an adult man, he would read four different newspapers and four different languages while he was eating his breakfast. He was a smart dude. He had an older brother who was very much against the czar and the Romanov family as a whole, and he was a revolutionary, and his brother was captured, and his brother was executed, thus making Vladimir Ulyanov dedicated to ending Romanov's czarist rule for the rest of his life. So he himself becomes a radical. He embraces the ideas of communism, but he does not believe in a pure Marxist form of the evolution of society. He saw what happened in the Paris Commune, studied the Paris Commune in depth, and realized that revolutions cannot be entirely democratic. You need to have a strong, well-educated elite that goes to the people, to the masses. They don't democratize them. They lead them. All right. Vladimir Ulyanov will, one time during one of his stays in prison, he will give himself a nom de guerre. He'll give himself his own name, which is Lenin. What does Lenin mean? I have no clue. I don't know if it means anything. I don't know if anybody knows what Lenin means. I, I don't know if this could have been just something he made up or, you know, it had some special meaning to him personally. Uh, Lenin was, he kind of kept to himself. He was not an emotional guy. Uh, he, I don't think he smiled a lot, told jokes. That's not really his disposition. He did keep a lot to himself. Uh, so who knows what Lenin means. But he gives himself his own name. Vladimir Ulyanov then simply becomes Vladimir Lenin. So, and here's an example of one of his texts, What is to be Done?, and in his works, he, and this is Leninism now, he doesn't believe that, you know, the masses are simply going to rise up on their own, like Karl Marx predicted. Instead, Lenin believes you need to have a handful of well-educated people who are true communist revolutionaries. They're going to then go down to the masses, and they're going to lead them in revolt. Honestly, Lenin doesn't believe that the masses are capable of leading themselves. Hey, why not meet this particular individual, Nadja Krupskaya, 
<laughs> Let me try to say that again. Nadia Krupskaya. I hope I'm saying her name right. Uh, Lenin's wife. Uh, they met, I believe, at a some sort of political function, but then they got together when they were both in prison at the same time for being revolutionaries. Krupskaya will play a uh, an important role uh, in in, in the story of communism at the end of Lenin's life. And we'll get to that a little bit later on, but let's return to the royal family. All right, so there he is, Nicholas II. Nicholas II, we get to the, to the dawn of the 20th century. He's got problems. They're international problems. He's got a problem on his border, and it's not in Europe. It's way over on the Pacific Rim in Japan. Japan in the late 19th century got on board with acting essentially like a colonial European power. And they began colonizing, or I guess going into China. Uh, and hey, Korea too, for what it's worth. And when we get to the year 1905, uh, Japan took over a Russian city there on Russia's uh, eastern border called Port Arthur. When Port Arthur was invaded, then Russia and Japan go to war. Uh, Japan did not declare war. Japan just simply started taking over land that didn't belong to them. So Russia responds by declaring war. And uh, at first there was a land battle that happened between Russia and Japan. And it was actually, it's actually one of the largest land battles in all of world history. There were some 600,000 people in this one battle. And Japan versus Russia... Japan wins, Russia loses. So Russia then uh, mobilizes its fleet and it sends the Russian Navy from St. Petersburg around three continents. It takes them six months to get to Japan. When they get to Japan, the Japanese Navy, which had never been in any active battle ever before in modern history, uh, they sink the Russian Navy. So it was a complete embarrassment. In 1905, Japan wins uh, two major battles against the Russians. This humiliation reflected everything wrong with Russia. They don't have a strong military. The people aren't proud to fight for them. It represents the Tsar's ignorance. Uh, there was there was a lot that uh, the Russian people see as being wrong with this. Now, in, in the in the failure of the Russians in the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, was sort of a cue for revolution. In response to the failed attack on Japan, a well-organized group of 200,000 Russians in Saint Petersburg marched up to the Winter Palace. The Winter Palace is where. Uh, the royal family lives, and they were chanting, God save the Tsar, God save the Tsar. Now, why would they chant that if they want reform? Well, like so many revolutions before in history, uh, they're hoping that the one individual with the most power is going to be the one who is capable of making a change. Now, the Romanovs were not actually there in the Winter Palace at the time, but the military was, and they were standing guard of the Winter Palace, uh, the commanders were fearful of this rather large gathering of people, so, of course, they just started shooting them. This was successful in terms of putting down this group of people that were chanting for reform, but, of course, those that make it back and those that make it back home and those that survive, now they really want to have a change. And so different groups started forming. So the revolution of 1905 sort of continues. So here's an important group that forms in 1905. They are called a Soviet. Now, obviously, that word Soviet is going to be a really important term. So let's learn about what the, Soviet, what the Soviets were originally. So a Soviet originally, or what it means in Russian, a Soviet means a workers' council. Technically, it just means a council. But in 1905, they were a workers' council. Okay, so what's that? What's a workers' council? In these various industrial manufacturing plants, these groups started forming, groups that want change, groups that want reform. Think of this as, in part, a union, but it's also got political motivations too. But in 1905, they thought, well, we can bring about change by, by, by unifying and creating a general strike. So in St. Petersburg in 1905, a Soviet is formed, 
Again, this is a workers' council. What do they do? They all unite to engage in a general strike. We are going to quit manufacturing anything until our demands are met. Okay, so that's what a Soviet is at this point in time in history. Now, are they communist revolutionaries? Well, some of them are, but not all of them. A lot of them simply want some sort of reform. Some of them still believe in the czar. So they're not all wild radical revolutionaries yet. This is a workers' council, but this idea of a Soviet is going to be taken over by the Bolsheviks, by the communist revolutionaries later on. But there they are. Now, if you're able to look at this picture for a second, check it out and look at, on the, well, I guess the front row, you've got a couple of cute kids there standing in the forefront. But then you see these six guys in the lowest row here. And if you look, there's an X at the bottom of one of them. Uh, somebody has X this particular individual on this photograph because that person uh, with the X sort of on his leg uh, will go on to be a very famous person during the Russian Revolution. That is a man named Leon Trotsky. Leon Trotsky, who will be one of the most important Bolsheviks, one of the most important communist revolutionaries during the actual Russian Revolution of 1917. Okay, so the Soviets in 1905, we're still back in 1905, do they have any success with this general strike of shutting down St. Petersburg? Well, yes, <clears throat> they do. The one reform that they get is they force Nicholas II to accept a parliament. Now, the Russian parliament is called the Duma. I hope this is a word that you know by now, the Russian Duma. Does Nicholas II like the Duma? Does he support the Duma? No, he does not. He does not even believe in the Duma. Nicholas II is a traditional old-fashioned guy, not unlike Alexander III. He does not believe in reform, and he does everything to limit the power of the Duma without starting another revolution. Okay, but the creation of the Duma does help sort of quell the revolution of 1905. Uh, for what it's worth, Russia still has a, or Russia has a Duma today. The Russia will the Duma will go away when the Soviet Union emerges. They will have a a, a Politburo. Uh, that is what their if we can call it Congress is uh, the Politburo. But then after the collapse of the Soviet Union in December 1991, the Duma is brought back with the Russian Federation, and Russia still today has a Duma. Although one can argue, well, how much power does the Duma have today? Uh, and it's probably limited just like it was back then in the dawn of the 20th century. Okay. Okay. After 1905, you have the emergence of, well, political parties, um, sort of. We don't really have political parties. So essentially what these are, are propaganda machines. These are political groups that want to see a particular future for Russia, but they don't really have any say in the Duma. Okay, so the first group that we need to know about are the Mensheviks. The majority of reformers were Mensheviks. Okay, what do the Mensheviks believe in? The Mensheviks believe in slow democratic reform. So let's industrialize. Let's have free trade. We then create a bourgeois class of people in Russian society. So the Mensheviks essentially want to turn... Russia of the early 20th century into the United States of America of the early 20th century. We've got democracy. We've got universal male suffrage. These, these are what they want. We'll have free trade. We'll have the emergence of an industrial class of individuals who will own the factory. And then we put people to work and we're industrializing and the economy's picking up. Okay. But then what's going to happen? Well, inevitably, as happened in the United States of America and France and Germany and, and, and Britain, of course, uh, you've got this large working class that feels exploited. But if they have then the right to vote, uh, then they can begin making changes. So what type of changes will they want? Well, weekend, limited work week, uh, health care, workers' compensation, these types of things. And so then they'll, uh, they'll, they'll evolve from being uh, a free trade state into a moderate socialist state with a mixed economy. This is what the Mensheviks want. All right. 
But the Mensheviks were seen by another group, which was actually a minority group, as, well, this all sounds like it's going to take a long time and it's going to be way too slow. The Mensheviks will say, yeah, 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 but that's a good thing. You want change to evolve. You want things to be slow. That way, things kind of, even though they move slowly, they move securely. But other people are like, nope, we want radical revolution and we want it now. So the, there's the Mensheviks. Let's talk about the ones that want radical revolution and they want it now. The Bolsheviks. Bolsheviks are communists. They want communist revolution now. They don't want to go through this, you know, evolve from like each stage of society from being feudal to being capitalist to being moderate socialist. No, they want a complete revolution. So they want to overthrow the government. They want to overthrow the landlords. They want to completely take over. They want a government that completely takes over all property everywhere and redistribute it equally to the people. Communism. That's what the Bolsheviks want. Let's quit messing around. Let's quit playing nice. The Mensheviks want way too slow of progress. We need a proletariat revolution now. Those are the Bolsheviks. All right. Mensheviks, Bolsheviks, got it? Great. Let's go back to the royal family. Poor, poor Alexei. He gets a cut. He may bleed to death. That's not good for the future czar. We got to take care of him. Here he is. He's got Alexandra with her arms around him. Hey, by the way, Alexandra, you're German by birth. Are you like Catherine the Great and like say, no, I renounced my German heritage and now I'm fully Russian? Mm, not so much. Alexandra really didn't like many Russians at all. She thought all Russians were kind of stupid, dumb, and backward, except for like the elite Russians that hung out with her in St. Petersburg and the Winter Palace and elsewhere. So yeah, that's kind of another reason. So we can sort of think of her as the Marie Antoinette of the Russian Revolution. Russians don't really think that she cares about them, and she doesn't. So there's Alexandra. Okay, there's little Alexei. Oh, poor little Alexei. He could bleed to death. Are the doctors helping him? No. So what's, Alec so what's Alexandra? What's mom do? And what does dad do? Well, they hire somebody who says, I can heal Alexei. And he's this guy. Check this guy out. This is our mad monk from Siberia. His name is Rasputin. Rasputin is what we would call today a faith healer. The royal family hires this man who says, I have the power of God within me and I can heal your son. Nicholas and Alexandra, especially Nicholas, a very, very religious man, believes Rasputin and entrusts his son care to Rasputin. What does Rasputin do? Well, two things that earns the faith of the family. One, he hypnotizes um, Alexei. He hypnotizes him. Now, after Rasputin hypnotizes him, he said that, you know, he successfully, you know, brought the power of God back on or down to down to Alexei and he won't uh, and, and he could cure his ble his his bleeding, his hemophilia. Um, if there was any truth to this, uh, it's because when you're hypnotized, your 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 blood flow slows down, your heart rate slows down, you're sort of half awake. And so that may have, if he was bleeding at the time, actually slowed the blood down a little bit to maybe be able to coagulate. The other thing, the second thing that Rasputin did was um, he correctly predicted uh, that Alexei would experience better health at particular times. So Alexei's health, sometimes he's really sick, sometimes he was well. And Rasputin said uh, several times, hey, he's going to get better at this particular date. And he called it correctly. And the family thought, oh, he's got all these, the powers of God in him. Rasputin was very, very tall. He was extraordinarily strong. He was Siberian, so he's from Eastern Asia. He uh, did not shower a lot, but he had this incredible charisma. Nicholas II would spend long periods of time talking to Rasputin, and whenever he was worrying about the people or, or World War I, after World War I breaks out, he would talk about how Rasputin put him at ease. Now, how does Rasputin put him at ease? Rasputin puts this very religious czar at ease by reminding him that you are the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. You need to get right with God. You need to have faith in God and just not worry about Russia industrializing or being a modern state. 
Russia is different from the West, from the West, and that's good. They are holier. When it came to the First World War, Rasputin, like several people, argued that this was a holy war. Throughout the First World War, Tsar Nicholas II would visit the troops on the Eastern Front to try to inspire them. You see him here reviewing a line of soldiers with his son Alexei. Like I said, Tsar Nicholas II did this several times, and it usually didn't work out with, well for him. He was short. He was awkward. He didn't seem to inspire a lot of confidence or trust in his men. He lacked the necessary charisma to inspire his men. And sadly, when it came to Rasputin, Rasputin was increasingly having a say in the government while Nicholas II was gone. He had earned the faith and the trust of Alexandra, as well as Nicholas II. Rasputin began having a stronger voice in government. So if you wanted to speak to the royal family, you pretty much had to go through Rasputin. He helped determine who would be good in the government, who would not be good in the government. So essentially government appointments were being made through the Council of Rasputin. And then we have this particular image of Rasputin, where Rasputin would have some wild and crazy parties. And I don't feel entirely comfortable in this recorded slideshow lecture and getting into all the shenanigans that Rasputin was into in these wild and crazy parties. But suffice it to say that his ability to charm extended far beyond the royal family. This is kind of weird for me because he was tall, he didn't bathe much, he had weird wild eyes, but man, people were entranced by him. So he had these wild and crazy parties, which feel free to look them up. But it did cause a lot of concern with other people in the government who saw Rasputin and, ha and having way too much influence over the royal family. So very famously, Rasputin gets assassinated. Here's Rasputin's dead body. The assassination of Rasputin has gone down into legend. Supposedly, first they tried to, uh, the people who were trying to get rid of him, who were trying to support the royal family and essentially save the royal family from this madman, uh, poisoned his drinks with cy poisoned his drink he was, at dinner. He was drinking wine with a bunch of cyanide, uh, enough cyanide to kill like ten men or something like that. And he drank it, and all it did was make him a little tired. And he goes to bed, and then he still is not dead. So. They try to shoot him. They shoot him multiple times. That doesn't work. Then they bludgeon him over the head. Uh, that doesn't work. He's like running out of the palace and they, he's chased down. And finally, he's caught and thrown into the Neva River in St. Petersburg. And he finally dies from drowning. Now, all that might be an exaggeration. It, it might have been exaggerated for effect that, you know, that it, he was simply so hard to kill that kind of lends to the monstrosity of uh, Rasputin and why he needed to, to die, that he was just this gigantic animal with supposedly mystical powers. But Rasputin, a faith healer from Siberia, plays an important role in Russian history. All right, it's 1917. It's the dawn of 1917. We're entering into the third year of the war. Russia is not faring well. The battles of Masurian Lakes and Tannenberg on the Eastern Front have devastated Russia. The Germans have successfully made their way into Russia. They are invading Russia. Russia simply doesn't have the industry or the resources to be able to fight the Germans. And people are going hungry. Here is a very famous image of February 1917. Take a look at who you see in this image. The majority of people in this image are women and children. They are marching. They are holding up banners. What do the banners say here in Russian Cyrillic? They are asking for soldiers to have more food. This is the Women's Bread March, if we can call it that. Uh, these were the bread riots of February 1917, and this is the spark that starts the Russian Revolution. All right, I'm gonna fast forward to this next image here just because it's got the dates on it. Now, in Russia, this is known as the February Revolution. And, and the Russian, and, and, but it was actually happening in March on our calendar. Oops, sorry, 
I didn't mean to jump ahead to Kerensky there. All right, so let's take a look at this image. So uh, the February Revolution was happening on February the 23rd on the Russian calendar. And so the Russian calendar uh, was still using the old Julian calendar. Uh, we talked during the Scientific Revolution about how uh, in most of Europe they adopted a new calendar, uh, but the Russians did not. Uh, they kept the old Julian calendar. So uh, when we get to 1917 and they have their various revolutions and they, and they name their revolutions after months, so you've got uh, the February Revolution and then you have what we call Red October where the Bolsheviks are successful. Um, these are actually not February or October in our calendar. They're actually March and November in our calendar. So let's check it out. Uh, the February Revolution was happening on February the 23rd in Russia, but it was actually March the 8th here. Some historians like to point out the coincidence of this. Uh, March the 8th is International Women's Day, and, it, the, and the February Revolution was started by, you know, not soldiers, but women marching through the streets of St. Petersburg. But here, too, I must offer some clarification. St. Petersburg is technically not St. Petersburg during World War I. St. Petersburg was briefly renamed Petrograd, which means in Russian, Peter's City. So it went from St. Petersburg to Peter's City or Petrograd. All right. All right, so I know all that's kind of cumbersome and annoying, some small details there. Hey, kids, I'm sorry. Let me get to the big stuff. All right, so you've got the Russian army losing, 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 losing. The Russian army can't get paid. They can't get well fed. So the women of the city of St. Petersburg, sorry, Petrograd, they rise up and they march in the streets and they march in the streets and they march in the streets. And the czar sends out the army to disperse the marchers on the streets. During the February Revolution, they send the army out. Uh, he, the Tsar sends the army out to put down the women's march, the bread march in, in Petrograd. Now, this was the pivotal moment. I need you to use your imaginations here. You've got the Russian army and you've got the women's bread march and the supporters of the women's bread march. And the Russian army is told to clear the women out. Now, if, you, if you're in the Russian army at this time, you got a gun in your hand and you're told to disperse these women, how are you going to do that? Essentially, it might mean you're going to have to shoot these women who are Russian citizens of Petrograd. Could you do it? In the end, the Russian soldiers join the bread march and they, are, and, and they turn their backs to the czar. At this point in time, the czar has no support and the Tsar loses all control. What is he going to do? His own army has turned against him. His own army has joined the bread marchers in Petrograd. All right. Guys, let me take a moment here to break from this point of time in history and do some historical synthesis. The Soviet Union is going to collapse. That collapse later on in history. After the Soviet Union gets established, it'll collapse and it'll start to collapse in the fall of 1991, or actually technically the late summer of 1991. And it is going to collapse in the exact same way. The Russian military is going to be sent to disperse a crowd, only this time it's not going to be in St. Petersburg, it's going to be in uh, Moscow. And the Russian military couldn't fire upon its own people. And that's essentially what brings down the Soviet Union in 1991. And it's the same thing that actually started the creation of the Soviet Union back in 1917 is the Russian army not being able to fire upon its own people. Okay, let me go back to 1917. Thanks for letting me do some uh, historical synthesis there. All right, so what happens? All right, the Tsar pretty much uh, has no power. The Duma is now going to have all the power. Uh, the individual who emerges as the most important person, the most powerful voice in the Duma is this particular individual right here, Alexander Kerensky. Alexander Kerensky. So Alexander Kerensky and the Duma are now leading Russia. It's late winter, spring, 1917. All right, what are you guys going to do, Duma? What are you going to do, Alexander Kerensky? You've got an unpopular war. You're still, are you going to continue to fight? Or are you going to give up? Are you going to surrender uh, and, and have a truce with the Germans? What are you going to do? In the end, and this becomes a monumental decision, Kerensky decides that, and, and the Duma as a whole, decide that they have to honor their treaty 
with Britain and France. They have to continue to fight this war against the Germans. Uh, they believed in the honor of the treaty, and they hoped that once they won the war, then Britain and France would be instrumental in helping them to democratize all of Russia. The other thing that's going on in Kerensky's head is, coincidentally, the French Revolution. Kerensky knew his history, and he knew that after France had become a republic, that there was this fighting spirit that developed among the French. And there were things like the miracle of Valmy, uh, and, and where, the, where the French army was pushing back the Prussians and the Austrians. And, there were, and, and Kerensky thought the same thing would happen, that, okay, now we've, we've gotten rid of the Tsar, he has no power. Um, and the Duma is in control, and we're going to create some sort of republic. Again, it's sort of up in the air. It's a provisional government at this point in time. We don't know which way we're going forward. Or we're going to have a constitutional monarchy. Or we're going to be a full republic. What are we going to do? Um, um, and and they and Kerensky thinks people are going to be so inspired by this that they're going to rise up and they're going to fight hard for Russia. This doesn't happen, and in fact, the inverse happens that people are even more demoralized now. There's a revolution that's successful and uh, the war must continue and the Germans are gonna continue to win. Okay, now the fact that Kerensky had continued to, to the war uh, and, 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 and forced Russia to continue to fight, or the Duma had forced Russia to continue to fight, kind of goes hand in hand with this other thing that's happening. With the abdication of the Tsar in March of 1917, and Russia becomes a republic in March of 1917, there is once again a call for land reform. You had this situation throughout most of Russia where there were these large farms owned by particularly successful uh, landlords, and there, needed to, and there was this push now to create some sort of land reform, especially for all the peasants who were going and fighting for Russia didn't they deserve to come back and have land for themselves? So there was talk. And here's where the Zemsfos get in, come back. Uh, come back into the story, that is. They never went away. But the Zemsfos are becoming vital now to this sort of land reform that's going to happen now that we've got a new government in Russia. And essentially what started happening was this. A lot of soldiers on the Eastern Front for Russia, they simply left the Eastern Front. Uh, this is treason, of course, but they just left. They're like, the heck with it. And they went back to participate in the land reform movement that's happening throughout Russia. Now, Kerensky. How does Kerensky feel about land reform? Kerensky and the Duma believe that some form of land reform needs to happen. There needs to be some redistribution of property to create a new, stronger Russian republic. But they can't do that in the middle of a war. So what Kerensky and the Duma is asking the people is, hold on, keep fighting, let's win the war against the Germans. After that's over, we'll have the support of Britain and France uh, in providing probably some financial assistance and some help with democratization of Russia, and we will engage in land reform, and we will create a new Russian republic. But essentially the Duma is saying, hold on, hold on, hold on. But most of the Russian soldiers have had it at this point in time, and they don't support the Duma, and they want land reform right now. Had Kerensky ended the war and done land reform, uh, he would have abandoned Britain and France. That might have had some long-term consequences. Uh, Germany uh, probably would have won World War I, uh, maybe even before the United States of America has a real chance to get involved. Um, but Russia might have remained a republic, and we'd have a completely different 20th century, and, and 21st century for that matter. But he doesn't. He says, let's continue to war, land reform comes later, and then you have the re-emergence of the Soviet. In Petrograd, the Workers' Council, the Workers' Soviet, they unite, they strike, they are trying to take control of the city. They want a full revolution. They feel abandoned by Kerensky and the Duma. They want revolution, revolution, revolution. And into, this, <laughs> and into Petrograd, in April of 1917, comes Lenin. 
Lenin had actually been outside of Russia for quite some time. He had been involved in several revolutionary activities against Tsar Nicholas II. He eventually went into exile into Switzerland. And the Germans got involved. And this is a very interesting move that the Germans made in 1917 as a way to win the war on the Eastern Front. They, the German government essentially made a deal with Vladimir Lenin. And the deal was this. So the German government reaching out to Lenin, who's in exile in Switzerland, and they said this, Lenin, we'll get you into Petrograd. We'll get you into Russia. Once you're in Russia, you lead a communist revolution. And when you take over the government, the first thing you do is you have you, you settle a peace with, the, with Germany. So you end the war on the Eastern Front. So this was a move that the German government made to end their war on the Eastern Front. They end the war on the Eastern Front. They ship all their troops and war material to the Western Front and unleash hell on the British and French on the Western Front. So this is a way that the Germans could win the war, the end the war on two fronts, get Lenin into Russia and have him overthrow the government. So if you take a look here on the left side of the screen, you've got a map of what they called the sealed train. So Lenin was placed with um, in, in a sealed train, literally, and shipped up through Sweden and then uh, Finland. And then he gets off the train in, uh, in Petrograd, where he takes control of the Petrograd Soviet and they begin the process of taking over Petrograd. In taking over Russia, Lenin had to use propaganda. Again, Lenin believes that the majority of people aren't supportive of full-fledged communist revolution. He believes that the majority of the people need to be led by this handful of elite. And so part of him influencing the rest of, rest of Russia was a newspaper that had actually existed since like 1905, 1906. It was a Bolshevik newspaper. And this Bolshevik newspaper was called Truth. The word truth in Russian is Pravda. So there's an early uh, example of Pravda right there. Um, of course, the irony is that this is uh, communist propaganda. It might not be fully truth. Uh, but it certainly is communist propaganda. So Lenin, he uses, uh, uses the newspaper Pravda to get his message across, to spread across uh, Russia, to inspire people to rise up and to create new Soviets. It's also at this particular point in time in 1917 that Lenin conscripts the help of this particular individual who plays a major role in the 20th century. His name is Joseph Stalin. Just like Lenin, Stalin gave himself his own name, as opposed to Lenin, which I have no clue what Lenin means. Stalin means steel. So uh, Joseph Stalin's original name was Joseph Jugashvili, and uh, he gave his name, instead of going by Jugashvili, he goes by his given name, Stalin, Joe Steel in Russian. So our man of steel. Seems an appropriate name uh, for Stalin because Stalin was himself sort of a tough guy thug. Didn't really have very many morals or values. Um, he was uh, essentially a bank robber. And so he stole money for the Bolsheviks. So that's Stalin. That's the role that he plays really early on. We'll come back to him later in the course. In July of 1917, the Bolsheviks rose up in Petrograd to try to drive out all of uh, the, go uh, the government forces and take over the city. You know, one way to think of the Soviet of Petrograd is a little bit like the Paris Commune of 1871. You had the federal government, which in 1917 Russia is the Duma, and then you had the Soviet taking over St. Petersburg, or, or Petrograd rather, and parts of Petrograd, and they were trying to rule themselves autonomously by Bolshevik principles. Lenin had inspired in July of 1917 this Bolshevik uprising, and the Russian government put down this Bolshevik uprising. They simply uh, they armed their policemen with machine guns, they went in, they started shooting Bolsheviks. Lenin himself escaped from this. He ran north to Finland where he disguised himself, and you see Lenin disguised right here. And Lenin, by all accounts, became extraordinarily depressed and really thinks this is it, my life's a failure, we're never going to have communism. But what he later found out was it just wasn't the right time yet. When you get to October of 1917, Kerensky does not trust the Soviets at all. 
he does not trust the Bolsheviks at all. And so he is head of the military, his head of the army, was a man by the name of General Kornilov. And Kerensky asked General Kornilov to go into Petrograd to put down the remainder of the Soviet forces that were once again beginning to acquire more people and more strength in Petrograd. So General Kornilov led men into Petrograd to once again put down the Soviets. It was October of 1917. Now the thing is, this time it failed because once again, the soldiers refused to fire upon Russian people who they saw as being good people. So the Russian soldiers start turning Bolshevik at this particular point of time in St. Petersburg. So here's the, here's the Russian army approaching the Winter Palace. Kerensky and the Duma are now under assault. Uh, as the Soviets are truly be having a successful revolution. Ten days in October, it took them ten days to take over all of Petrograd and, uh, and, and, and just start creating a new country. So what happens to our man Kerensky? Well, the end of Kerensky. Kerensky was actually able to escape Petrograd. What did he do? Well, he was in the Winter Palace and he disguised himself as a woman. So in other words, he sort of looked like one of the help, and he left with another group of women who were fleeing the Winter Palace at the time. He escapes, he makes his way to the United States of America, where he goes to California, where he becomes an economics professor at Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. So if you look at the right there, that picture is of uh, Kerensky a little bit later on in history, in the 1950s, where he was an econ professor at Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. Hey, great job, Kerensky. He lives till 1970, until 1970, where he dies, an American. All right, back to the Soviet Union, or the creation of the Soviet Union. Lenin's done it. After October of 1917, he's done it. He has taken over Petrograd. The Bolsheviks are in control of Russia's capital imperial city. Now, they still have a long way to go to take over all of Russia. Russia's a huge country. It's the biggest country in the world. But they've taken over the capital city, and that's a pretty good start. This is where we get to learn about Leon Trotsky. Leon Trotsky plays a very important role as we go into 1918. First of all, Leon Trotsky has his own ideas about communism, and his name is associated with his particular uh, ideological view of communism. So there is something called Trotskyism, and people who support Trotsky are called Trotskyites. What does it mean to be a Trotskyite? What did Trotsky believe? Leon Trotsky believes that you can never have a successful communist revolution unless it is a, an international communist revolution. So you couldn't have one country be a communist country surrounded by non-communist countries because those non-communist countries will always look at the communist country as a threat. So Leon Trotsky believes that all the workers all around the world must rise up and, and fight. So this very much influences Trotsky. Trotsky is sent to the Eastern Front, to the Polish town of Brest-Litovsk, where he meets with the German High Command to create a peace treaty to end the war on the Eastern Front. Now, in this peace treaty, Lenin and Trotsky are going to sacrifice an incredible amount of Russian land that they have acquired over the course of the last 200 years to the Germans. Does that bother them that they're sacrificing it's something like one-third of, of, of European Russia to the Germans? That they're going to give Germans this huge land mass to the or they're, they're going to give to the Germans this huge land mass? No, it doesn't bother them. For Lenin, there's sort of bigger fish to fry. They need to take over the rest of Russia to create this Russian communist state. But for Trotsky, Trotsky believes, well, you know, Russia is going to become a communist country. It is becoming a communist country. But then the Germans are going to be kind of fall right behind. So as Trotsky was on a train going from Petrograd into Poland to sign this peace treaty deal to end the war on the Eastern Front, he actually was distributing pamphlets to the, to the German soldiers, encouraging them to start their own communist revolution in Germany. Why would you fight for powerful German 
landlords and why would you fight for your emperor? They don't have your best interest in mind. Join us. Join your Russian proletariat brethren and rise up in a mighty international revolution. This almost got him in a little bit of trouble and almost ended the treaty from happening, but in the end, the treaty still happened. And this is the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk of 1918. What does it do? Well, it, it secedes a whole bunch of Russian land to the Germans. Now, in 1918, Germany can take its entire eastern army and throw it at the, west, uh, at the western front and at the French and at the British and at the Americans because the Americans are there in 1918. All right, but back to Russia. They are no longer at war with World War I, but they've got to fight a civil war. So the Russian Civil War, which lasts from approximately 1917 and 1921, approximately, we have two general groups. The first are the Reds and the other are the Whites. The Reds are the Communists. The Whites are the people who are against Communists. Now, what's that mean? Are the whites, do they, do they all believe in the same government if they do win the Russian Civil War and what they're going to set up? No, and that's a problem. The Reds had, um, they, they were very unified, and this is one of the reasons why they're going to end up winning the Russian Civil War. They have their slogan, and their slogan is peace, land, and bread. Peace, land, and bread. It's a good, strong, simple slogan that encapsulates everything they're fighting for. Peace and World War I. Land, we're going to have land reform, we're going to have a whole bunch of reform, and bread, we're going to feed the people. That's what the communists are going to do. Hey, whites, what are you going to do? Well, they don't really know. Some of them believe in the monarchy, they want to bring, or they want to bring the czar back. Some believe in a republic, some believe in a constitutional monarchy. Uh, there's a wide variety of disagreement about the, between the whites, but the one thing that unites the whites is they're all against the reds. But this sort of lack of a coherent message doesn't resonate with most of the Russian people. The Russian people here, peace, land, bread, they're like, all right, that's what I want to fight for. The whites, well, you know, some of us support the czar, some of us believe in a republic. Uh, the whites don't really, they don't have a clear message. And the fact that the reds had a clear message, that was a strong propaganda machine. How about the royal family? What about the royal family? Well, the royal family, uh, they got to live during the time of the provisional government, but they are captured by the Reds after Red October, and the Russian family is being held. Now, the Romanovs at this point in time, Alexandra and Nicholas II, their four daughters and their son Alexei, they're going to face what monarchs previously in European have had to face during a revolution. Think Charles I during the English Civil War. Think Louis XVI during the French Revolution. So long as there are people who want to put these this family back on the throne in Petrograd or St. Petersburg or whatever you want to call it, then they are a threat to the revolution, to the Reds, to the Bolsheviks. And so the Bolsheviks keep them in hiding and they take them to the Ural Mountains and they sort of move them around from safe spot to safe spot to safe spot, but they've got to keep them away from the whites. In the end, it will be decided, let's just kill them. So, what happens to the Romanovs? They're woken up in the middle of the night in one particular house where they're hiding. The Bolsheviks that are holding them captive say, come on, the white army is near, you're going into the basement. They take them down into the basement and they execute them all with machine gun fire. And then they take them out and they bury them. Now, they're all dead. <laughs> But I hinted at before that there was a story of uh, Anastasia that has since made her famous. Um, so let's take a look at Anastasia. There she is, the youngest girl there with her arm around young Alexei. Later on in the 1950s, there was a woman who emerged in Paris, France, and she claimed to be Anastasia. Somehow, mysteriously, she was able to get away from the Reds and make her way across Europe, and she had suffered memory loss and all this, and then she realized that she was Anastasia. She was fluent in Russia, Russian. She had these, these incredible memories of growing up in the Romanov household, and she remembers all these things. And so she claimed that she was Anastasia, this, this, this woman. So there were actually some cousins of the Romanovs that were still around at the time, and they met her, and they're like, yeah, this is really Anastasia. 
she remembers things that, you know, are, are very particular to, you know, that the household in which she grew up. But then later on, this woman was identified as a fraud. And then much later on in history, specifically the late 1990s, uh, after the Soviet Union had collapsed um, and the remains uh, of the royal family were dug up and we have the capacity to do DNA testing in the late 1990s. Uh, they tested the DNA of the remains of all the people there and Anastasia was among them. So Anastasia never made it out alive. She was executed with her family. All right, back to the Russian Revolution. Leon Trotsky, having uh, signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, is back and he is in charge of the Red Army. He is the War Commissar. He has for him, uh, working for him, a great propaganda message, peace, land, bread, peace, land, bread. He's going to inspire the peasants to rise up, but he has taken control of the Russian army, which has now become the Red Army, greatly inspired by this new communist revolution. In fighting the whites, this individual, Leon Trotsky, who has no military experience, but he's very well educated and has read the journals of Julius Caesar, uses a method to inspire fighting, a method called decimation. Now, you've probably heard this word used before. Uh, if something's decimated, that means it's you know, blown to bits. But here's what decimation actually is. In the word decimate, you hear the prefix deca as in 10. What decimation really is, is this. Leon Trotsky would tell his you know, a regiment to go and fight the whites. If they retreated and they disengaged from the fight, then Trotsky said, okay, he would line them all up and every 10th man he would shoot. So he would kill one in every 10 men. So if you went into battle fighting for Trotsky and the Red Army and you were like, this battle's too tough, we're going to have to retreat, we're going to have to pull back, then you face decimation from Leon Trotsky. It's pretty brutal. It was also very effective. The Red Army is going to win this war. Here's another thing that the Red Army did to win this war. They called upon the peasants to just simply rise up and start killing landlords. What a brilliant move. These peasants, they're not educated in Marxist communist thought. They don't even know what this stuff is. But when they're told, you are a legitimate army by rising up and killing landlords, that's all they need to hear. So they rise up and across Russia, you have not really a communist revolution, but essentially anarchism. You have these peasants rising up and sacking the, the, the homes of landlords. And you essentially got these peasant armies that will eventually become part of the Red Army. But for the most part, it's just peasants rising up and killing landlords and taking food. Now, concerning food... It's during the Civil War that Lenin institutes something called war communism. War communism. Again, this is part of the peace, land, and bread. This is the bread. <laughs> what Lenin does is this. He establishes these Soviets all throughout Russia. And the Soviets throughout Russia is responsible for confiscating all food being grown by peasants. This food is then redistributed equally. So this is war communism. So farmers on the farm, everything that they produce must be given to the local Soviet. The local Soviet then distributes the food equally to all people. It's communism. All right. Also part of what they call war, war communism is all property is going to be confiscated by the government. There's going to be no private property. And of course, for the peasants, this sounds fantastic. We're totally eliminating property owners. We're, we're eliminating a wealthy class. And for them, this is a pretty exciting time. There is this massive reform that's happening throughout the Soviet Union. So the peasants were mostly on board with this and mostly leaning towards uh, the Red Army during the Russian uh, or during the during the Civil War of 1917 to 1921. Okay. It is because all Lenin was able to successfully establish all of these Soviets throughout uh, Russia that we now have a new name for our country. And this new name is the United Soviet Socialist Republics. Of course, we can use it simply as an acronym, the USSR. We can also abbreviate, abbreviate it as the Soviet Union. And we've got the new flag of the Soviet Union, of course, this is an image of 
Vladimir Lenin in front of a waving Soviet Union flag. But let's check out the flag. It's symbolic in many levels. You have the blood red flag that was, of course, taken from the Paris Commune of 1871. Also notice that in the top left-hand corner, you have a sickle and a hammer. A sickle and a hammer. Why do we have a sickle and a hammer? These are the two symbols of the proletariat. The sickle is the symbol for the rural proletariat, the farmers, and the hammer of the urban proletariat, the factory workers. So that's why you have the sickle and the hammer, the two proletariat classes, the urban proletariat, and uh, the rural proletariat. And above the sickle and hammer, there is a star. What does the star symbolize? The star symbolizes the guiding force of the single party, the central communist party of the Soviet Union. So here we are, the Soviet Union, we're creating it. Probably the single greatest threat to the early USSR was a rebellion that happened um, in the Red Navy. So these were Soviet soldiers that were in the Soviet Navy in 1921. So these were Reds, these were Bolsheviks. And the Navy was among the first to join in the Red Revolution way back in 1917. It was in fact the Navy that had uh, gone up to uh, the the Winter Palace in Saint in, in in Petrograd because remember Petrograd previously Saint Petersburg is built right on the sea. It was Peter the Great's window to the west. Oh, it was the Navy. It was the Rus It was the Russian Navy that 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 turned its guns onto the Winter Palace while the Bolsheviks were storming the Winter Palace. The the Navy men were among the first in the Red Army. And so it was a terrible thing when in 1921, they become the first to rebel against the Soviet Union. What do these men want? They want more food. They want also more equal pay. So what do they do? They go on strike. They go on strike. So you would think going on strike, this is a very socialist thing to do, that the Communist Lenin and Trotsky and Stalin, they should all be like, hey, okay, guys, great job. You're protesting. You're a unified force. We'll work with you. We'll cooperate with you. Is this what happened? This is not what happens. Trotsky has these men executed. The Kronstadt Rebellion reflected that not all of the men were being treated equally in the Red Army, and most importantly, War communism as an economic policy wasn't working. Communism as an economic pol as an economic system was not working. So Lenin decides, I got to do something. I promised my people peace, land, and bread. Peace, land, and bread. I have to fulfill this promise. So in 1921, in response to the Kronstadt Rebellion, Lenin establishes something called the New Economic Policy or it's sometimes called the New Economic Plan, we can still we can just call it quite simply the NEP. The NEP. Now, what is NEP? What, what is the NEP? Well, listen carefully to this and think about what this is. Lenin says, okay, we're now no longer gonna have all food confiscated from ever or collected, I guess is probably the better word. We're, we're no longer gonna have 100 percent of the food produced on farms collected by the government and redistributed. We're not gonna do it like that. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna set quotas for each farm. We're gonna set quotas for each farm. So we want you to fulfill your quota. You, were, you give that to your local Soviet. Now, if there's any surplus, if there's any leftover, then you get to keep that. And you get to either eat it or more likely sell it. So what this means is we've got we've we still got quite a bit of food collection going on but now if you are a farmer in the early days of the USSR in 1921 you know and you're growing I don't know potatoes and you use 20% of your land to grow potatoes and give those potatoes to the to the government to the local soviet good they've got what they want now you can use the rest of your land to grow turnips or corn or 
harvest grain or whatever. Like you can, and, and you can use this stuff and then you can sell it. So what's that sound like to you? So now you've got farmers who can make additional money on the side. Essentially what it is, is it's a mixed economy. You've got part of this, uh, part, part of the food, which is collected by the government. Think of that as like a significant tax, but then you've got a new market that's going to open up. So let's talk about this new market. There were particular individuals. They're referred to by historians as the NEP men, the NEP men. So who are the NEP men? Well, look at this picture here. You have a village and you've got all the stuff that's for sale. It's essentially a farmer's market. So here's what was happening. Across the Russian countryside, there would come, be, there would come in individual men in carts, literally in carts. And they would say, hey, do you have anything you would like to sell me? And so the Russian farmers would be like, yes, we've already you know, given a certain amount of our goods to the Soviet. We've got all this extra stuff. And the net man would go, great, I will buy it. What have you got? Corn, potatoes, I'll buy it. And they'll buy it from the farmers. And then they'll take the stuff into town where they'll sell it at an increased price. And so you've got these middlemen, and these are the NEP men. They are a merchant class of buyers and sellers. Early Soviet Union was partially capitalist. So the NEP men, I found this nice little image from online. I stole it from somebody who was kind enough to make it for us. <laughs> but let's take a look. Let's start at the... Um, uh, let's start, let's start at the top left here, where it says the netmen scour the villages, buying up all the produce, or at least the produce that the farmers are willing to sell. And then they you know, take it into the cities, and they sell it off, and they make a prof profit. And then, oh, I guess I skipped over this part. They buy simple manufactured goods in the city. They take it to the countryside, to the farmers, and they'll sell it to them. So this is what the netmen are doing. They're making money. We're creating a merchant class. And, you know, this was a really exciting time from the few testimonies that I've I've been fortunate enough to read from you know books and documentaries on the early Soviet Union about this stuff. I found that it was at this particular point in time in Soviet history, really early on in the 1920s, um, the early 1920s, before Stalin comes around and takes control, that it was actually a pretty exciting time. There were a lot of uh, discussions. Uh, it sort of reminds me of the Paris Commune of 1871. Like a lot of discussions, like what are we going? What, what, what what's our country doing? How's it going forward? Um, it was this exciting, dynamic time. Uh, it was a great time for the arts, especially um, cinema. Uh, the Russians were doing some pretty incredible thing. Or excuse me, the Soviets were doing some pretty incredible things. It was a pretty exciting and dynamic time. It didn't really have to turn into an awful dictatorship. Uh, and, and it was unclear that this is the direction that the Soviet Union was going in like 1923, 1924. But that is, of course, what ended up happening. So let's wrap this up. Vladimir Ulyanov Lenin had a stroke in 1922. His face was partially paralyzed. He was incapable of ruling. It was at this point in time that his wife was instrumental in helping him out. Lenin had dictated to her a final testament. And in his last testament, Lenin bemoaned the fact that he saw the Communist Party splitting. And this last testament warns the Soviet people of certain people in the Central Communist Party. He does say some disparaging things about Trotsky, but he focuses most of his negativity toward Stalin. He saw Stalin as a particularly cruel individual. And in his last testament, he asked for Stalin to be removed from the Central Communist Party. However, Stalin, as cruel and thuggish as he was, was also very smart. Stalin had effectively a position on human resources in the Central Communist Party. He was essentially responsible for hiring and firing people in high-up government positions. And Stalin was only hiring people who were faithful to him and not to Trotsky. So when Lenin passes away in 1924, these are the two men who compete for power. But in the end, it's Stalin who will drive Trotsky out of Russia. Trotsky will go into hiding in Mexico. But Soviet ag agents will find Trotsky in hi hiding and they will murder Leon Trotsky. And Stalin will emerge as the next leader of the Soviet Union.
And hey, that's where we leave off with this one. Guys, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. We'll obviously be learning a lot more about the Soviet Union in the future. Until then, have a great day. I'll see you in class. Bye-bye.